Ready in the land of YouTube. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to get started. I'm going to grab a seat real quick. I know you guys are probably like, hey, two hours of Internet of Things. But it's going to be more in detail, this one. It's going to get more uh, low level. Hopefully, you guys learn a thing or two. From your uh, so I'll get started. Uh, my name is I work for, uh, for Belkin. So I'm coming more for, from the manufacturing side. You know, we have, you know, Belkin owns Linksys, so the routers, and the routers are controlled via their mobile app, too. They're the same thing as Internet of Things. They also have... Uh, you know, our home automation suite, Wemo, uh, same thing, uh, control, you know, your, your smart home via your mobile app, uh, things like that. Uh, I'm from the LA area. I'm on uh, the OWASP board for Los Angeles, Cloud Security Alliance, and uh, something called HCCIA. Uh, there's my Twitter, Twitter handle. Uh, if you guys want to follow me, I do a lot of like, IoT research, embedded, mobile security research. That's, so, uh, you know, follow me there. So I'm going to talk about, you know, a little bit of what uh, last time get really low level, really detailed, uh, kind of describe things you guys may not know about how these devices are created. I feel like everybody has their, you know, kind of like their input, but they don't really know exactly what it takes to build these devices for consumers and mass deployment, mass production, uh, all the different teams that are involved. So I'm going to talk about that and talk about, you know, the problems that we have and how we can solve it and, um, you know, basically the supply chain and big problems that the FTC and other people aren't really looking at. So, you know, like I said, I'll just go over light, light introduction of Internet of Things. I'm not going to say this word for word, but you guys know it's just network connected devices, all embedded technology, different type of OSs. Uh, you can control them, you know, like I said, via a, a mobile app for the most part, or whatever it is, a web interface, whatever you have, uh, just remotely is the idea. And again, here's uh, something I got from, uh, from uh, Post. Postgres. They have everything from IoT resources you can think of. Uh, if you want to learn about IoT, I would suggest uh, navigating there. I actually have the uh, the URL there. I'll, I'll kind of post it up. It's very, very tiny, but I don't want to take up too many real estate. Uh, but I'm not going to go over everything. You guys kind of know what IoT is and how you can apply it, uh, the different types of uh, business use cases and things like that. So we talked about hardware last talk. I'm going to talk about a little bit right here, how cheap these devices are. We talked about Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and these pan stamps here, which are, I think, like $5, uh, just to create this device uh, that you try to, you know, whether it's a POC, whether it's for mass production, um, the idea is that you have an idea that you want to implement for whatever reason to help your life, someone else's life. Um, so what it takes, it starts with the hardware, it starts with uh, an OS or a framework. Um, you know, people can build off of, of a Linux kernel, they can build it off Windows, uh, embedded platform, they can build it off of uh, frameworks that build upon, um, you know, uh, are compatible with Linux. So, uh, you know, Aldrin has their own. Riot, uh, HomeKit is just another platform, basically, uh, that you can, you know, have accessories, you have rooms and things like that. You can treat, you can control via your uh, your iPhone device. Uh, but open IT is pretty common. Uh, you also think, see things such as uh, RTOS, which is real time operating systems. Um, that's basically a stripped down version of OS of uh, it's. Believe it or not, uh, the Linux embedded systems, they're too much overhead. And these devices are tiny, so uh, like the, the sensor, a lot of these sensor devices, you know, very, very small devices, uh, these are what they call RTOS. So, uh, you know, there's no uh, unnecessary drivers that only what's needed to perform your actions. Uh, and there's people like uh, VxWorks who create, uh, you know, RTOS operating system, really open source. But uh, they're also, uh, not only for IoT devices, but they're also in anything embedded, like uh, routers, for example. We see a lot of, uh, I'm not going to name companies, but uh, security vulnerabilities in, um, you know, VxWorks type of uh, uh, platforms. And it kind of uh, goes from, well, maybe three vendors will use them, Falcon, D-Link, Netgear. We all, you know, we, we could all use the same type of ODM is what they're called in the same platform. So with these IoT devices, I mean, they, they, they control, you control it yeah, via, via your mobile app, but there's always a, an endpoint, a web service endpoint in the cloud, uh, AWS, Azure, VPS, somebody else has spun up cloud infrastructure. Um, you know, so there's different aspects, you know, we're talking about hardware, embedded, cloud, mobile. It's a lot, of, a lot of technology here involved just to get these devices to do what you want them to do. I think it's called everything here, and it basically provides that platform for you as well as the hardware, as well as uh, kind of like a boilerplate of code. You kind of just tweak it to whatever you need it to do. 
and uh, you know get your your uh, your prototype and your device out in production, people can use it, test it, and you can you know, iterate through it. You know, the, the different the protocols that these devices talk, there's not one type of protocol that is being used right now. There's, there's a ton, you know. There's a whole list here, NFC, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Lutron. These actually lights here are controlled by Lutron, which is a proprietary uh, uh, wireless frequency, I guess you'd say. It's all RF, uh, just different bands, uh, different, you know, you, know, you get 933 for Zigbee, also 2.4 gigahertz and everything else is on. Bluetooth low energy, like we were talking about locks. Locks usually are on BLE. Um, you know, an NFC. Uh, you know, and they all have different functions, but they all have to communicate. By. So they have like this abstraction layer, basically that uh, converts it to, you know, whatever layer seven protocol they're gonna be using, a REST API, SOAP XML, uh, you know, things like that. So again, was, you know, here's the protocols, you know, MQTT, and I was talking about REST and uh, GSM, things like that. All these devices communicate over these, uh, these protocols. And again, it's kind of like everybody's building their own, you know, um, the ecosystem is really not being friendly. So in order to make these guys kind of all play together and play nice, you need something called a hub. A Wink hub uh, is basically Wink, Insteon, there's smart things there, which is a uh, uh, Samsung's device, uh, and it basically bridges all these protocols together. Like the Wink, for example, it has uh, Zigbee, it has Bluetooth LE, it also has Wi-Fi, and then uh, I think it has Z-Wave as well. Uh, and then from there you control it via just the Wink app instead of having like five different apps. You know, one to control your lights, one to control your lock, one to control your you know uh, garage door opener. So kind of just one centralized device that actually can. Uh, Communicates and translates over uh, Wi-Fi over to uh, over to their hub. So Wink has an API that these partners like GE and um, and uh, Chamberlain and things like that that they uh, uh, abide by. Basically, uh, it's pretty open source. It's all REST API. Uh, you know, we talk about how many devices are going to be here. You know, even by next year, 4.9 billion according to uh, Gartner. Uh, I know I have a ton at my house. My house is filled with motion sensors and cameras and just every time I walk on my stairs, my lights are on, my room's on, my, uh, you know, I have a, a plug that actually measures how much energy I'm using, how much energy I'm saving, uh, and I have lights grouped in certain ways, or, because Zigbee, Zigbee can form mesh networks, uh, and auto heals too, so if something goes off, you know, it kind of fix each other, and you have your own kind of like coordinators, uh, basically that helps each other, so each protocol has their own, you know, um, uh, you know, pros and cons, uh, Wi-Fi overheads, and is low power, basically, not as much uh, CPU intensity on the device. Very, like I said, they're very small, uh, not a lot of, uh, you know, resources to take advantage of. You know, so I'm going to start at a very, very low level, the PCB board, really the, the uh, print circuit board. You know, I don't, I don't know if anybody has any hardware, hardware background, but, you know, there you start with the pads. Pads are actually what you solder to, the chip to, and then the lead, basically, you know how you see a, uh, let's see if we have them here. Probably can't do it, but. There's usually, there's usually like, um, you know, you have a board and then you're gonna solder, and there's a pad right there, and then these are called leads on the side, that actually solder to the board. Uh, and the traces are actually, the, you know, the circuit traces that you see, that's what actually what they're, what they're called. And you have silk screens, uh, things that actually have, um, on the board describes, you know, RX, TX, Things like that. You can have a number of silk screens. You can use silk screens to even hide things if, if you want, because uh, these boards have different layers, uh, mostly just for uh, electromagnetic issues, uh, analog and digital issues as well. Uh, you have to put analog on one side, digital on the other, uh, depending how you're creating your product. If you need any of that, and then even just to put these boards together, uh, you know, some of them, some of, some of these chips don't have leads, so you know, you, you get a chip like a wireless chip or CPU and in the bottom you're like, well, how do, they, how do they solder these things? You know, there's no nothing for me to solder, but basically it's just um, it has solder and flux in the bottom of it. And you just have to heat it up with the oven, and that's what this is right here. It's called reflow, uh, and that's how it just metal sticks to metal and it, and it sits together, and, that, and it just uh, that's how it communicates with the copper and all the traces, and uh, from there you know you actually get communication between devices uh, within within the PCB board. You know, and then you get the uh, board, uh, the BSPs, the guys who create the drivers, the Marvel guys, the Broadcom guys. You guys probably seen these in your wireless drivers. You know, you go in your you know, wireless network and you can try to find 
uh, network staff to uh, to join, and you'll see Broadcom and Marvell typically. Uh, but these guys are usually the uh, the big names. Uh, you know, so you always hear about like open source issues, like you know, how can I put this? So they have like uh, like for, for example, I work for Linksys. We have open WRT routers, uh, and there was a big issue where. Uh, you know, the community got mad because we didn't have, you know, it wasn't true open source because they didn't have access to the wireless drivers. In reality, it was these guys, the BSPs, it was, you know, who didn't release the drivers for us so people can fix issues and they couldn't tweak the drivers to how they wanted it. But basically, it starts with these guys. They create the drivers to communicate to that board. And again, it's just a binary blob, actually. So you have no insight as to what kind of code it is and how they're writing it. So if you're going to look through it, you're going to have to reverse it and it's going to be in C. Or, or even something even lower, uh, lower than that. And you have ODMs. ODMs are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. They're the guys uh, who basically create their own software stack, throw it on there, and um, you know they have they, their coding is, is, is ridiculous. They're, they're usually uh, startup companies. Uh, what they do is they'll get somebody like an ODM. It could be a group of uh, a group of ten people. Uh, just coding, you know, a UI stack, uh, and then communicating to the device, uh, just to do basic functionality uh, and making it work. And they provide their own APIs for, uh, let's say, you know, an OEM, someone like Falcon, uh, to communicate to and add their own functionality to it. So it's like, you know, they'll provide Linux kernel, uh, they'll provide some packages, uh, some basic functionality between the device, and then, you know, give, it gives, they give an SDK over to the OEM who, who then puts their own stack, like a put like a Belkin name on it, whatever it is. Um, you know, they also have their own cloud infrastructures now, like I was showing you guys before. They're also ODMs. Um, so like I said, so we have, uh, you know, there's a ton of them in China. Uh, there's so many names. It just depends who's coming out with what first. That big, big manufacturers choose them uh, to use for, uh, for, their, uh, for their project. So, um, you know, just because there's so many of them, usually like we have like six or seven at Balkan that we actually stick to. Uh, you know, for, for different drivers, whether it's uh, like our media server drivers or we have our, uh, our Samba drivers, again, those are all third party, all for one code base of, uh, you know, your embedded device, whether it's uh, a router, an IoT device, uh, a wearable. Uh, there's still different drivers, different code, code base, different teams, different countries. Uh, they're kind of, it's kind of everywhere right now, so it's kind of hard to expect some sort of secure code. You can't get one team to code securely. How are you going to get people from around the world to code securely? So, uh, you know, back to these uh, cloud providers, like these ODMs, um, you know, spin up. You know, we have the Amazon guys, the Google, uh, things works. And, you know, again, they have their, their own set of SDKs. So not only do you have the ODM SDKs, uh, you have the cloud service provider SDKs that the ODM talks to, or you as the OEM would then, you know, connect to uh, the cloud, the, the cloud APIs. So it's kind of like a big, you know, uh, tangle of, of technologies and, and troubles and, uh, you know, and I mean, you guys probably heard the, like the privacy issues, you know, you'll see one device actually contacting, connecting to 10, uh, 10, other, 10 other infrastructures, and you'll see it, uh, you know, you have companies like, uh, like Zipiter who are doing research, uh, not really mining, but kind of to protect their own privacy and see where actually these, uh, these endpoints, these uh, IoT devices are talking to. So it'll kind of carve, like you'll see like, you know, this general thing, they'll go, not even IoT device, but like Netflix. So you'll see like four net Netflix clusters that they usually talk to. Uh, but like Falcon, we'll talk to uh, like Amazon, for example. And then we may have like an analytics thing, maybe like a Splunk thing or something like that. But uh, nothing like personal, if you guys are curious about that. Just usage. So again, ODMs, that's us, Falcon, Linksys, we will resell it, we support it, we get all of the PR crap, basically, that we have to put up with from researchers, from uh, journalists, from people trying to make a name for themselves, uh, we're, the ones who, we're the ones who offer support, I mean, uh, warranties and things like that, you know, so we, just remember, we don't have the code in-house, so it's not something that we can fix, like, hey, yeah, come on, guys, let's work on it, you know. We have to inject something into somebody else's uh, uh, software development lifecycle, whatever it is, and you have to QA it. So it's it's a whole process. So um, if you're using ODM, uh, you know, for your product, 
you can you can build everything in house. Uh, just some people choose to outsource like like everything else because it's cheaper. And again, like I said, mostly it's in China. Typically, it's in China. Uh, and I've talked to these guys that you know I do these pre engagements with. You know, we're trying to build out new products, and I talk to these guys, and they have no idea. They're like, yeah, it's secure. HTTPS, 128-bit. I'm like, dude, no. Like, there's so much more you have to do. You have an embedded device. You have hardware, software, mobile, your cloud. I'm like, you know, what type of change control processes do you have? What type of, you know, do you guys have VPCs for your Amazon backend? They're like, I don't even know what that is. Dude, what's your access controls? What do, you, do you whitelist? What's your partner? You know, they have nothing. No, no type of policies, no type of guidelines. They're just... Just flying the seat of the pants and you know just trying to get a product out. Like I said, they're usually like teams of like ten people. There's small companies, but there's a ton of them out there. Just people who can code is, is basically who it is, and they're making a, you know good money out of it. Some of these people actually um, are related to people who work in the uh, uh, the BSP, like the Marvel, Broadcom. Like they'll have their own kids or whatever. They grew up with them, and they'll become the ODMs and they'll kind of spin up their own company. But now they have a direct distribution relationship with them, with the BSP, and now they're ODM, they can create a, a partnership uh, for, you know, just, just for a project, basically. So, you know, here's the supply chain I was trying to uh, describe. If you're BSP, your ODM, the cloud service provider, and then your OVM, and then you ship it out to the world, uh, you know, like I said, there's, it's all, it's, all these teams are everywhere, you know, you have well, Broadcoms in California, but I'm sure they outsource things to like India, outsource things to Korea, uh, everywhere else, China. And these devices are being manufactured for the most part in China. So, you know, who's doing integrity verification there? Nobody. It's just, you know, people are just putting it together and shipping it out. Uh, you know, and who's, you know, looking at, you know, security in, in all these aspects? Well, we are for OEM side, but uh, from top level down, it's kind of hard to... Uh, Make sure all these different teams, probably four or five teams within you know, BSPs, ODM, CSPs, BSP for sure, Marvel, Broadcom, they have like 30 teams at least. So again, from around the world, different teams, different places, different coding styles, different coding standards, different languages, different frameworks, uh, you know, platforms, instruction sets, ARM, MIPS, uh, whatever it is, they're all, it's all different, different, different types of code. Coming from around the world, and these people aren't really worried again about security. You know, they are usually, like I said, small teams, sales guys, uh, project manager guys, or program managers, and your engineers, the guys who are doing the work. That's all their team. You know, they're not focused on anything uh, with regards to security. You know, so sales obviously, we call business development. Let me, you know, get some more customers. How can we get more uh, projects to work on? Get some more money. You know, outreach out, create a relationship between a distributor or BSP, things like that. You know, PMs, like anything else, project managers, program managers, prioritize, make sure the team's uh, set for their, you know, what their goals, um, you know, just objective-based. Uh, uh, you have your engineers, you know, just work, 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 writing code, not much, you know, quality assurance being done, uh, you know, probably some, some unit tests and maybe some automation going, but nothing really, no, nothing really in depth, right? So, and again, you have, you know, your different, um, you know, UI and UX user experience, uh, different type of coders, you, you know, jQuery, this JavaScript, HTML, tracker. front end, the back end is connecting, you know, to, to your firmware, uh, whatever, you know, abstraction layer or application you're looking at, you're, you're, you know, you're using REST API or whatever it is from your mobile device, and to make sure the transportation between the hardware to the mobile to the cloud is all secure, you know, how are you going to do that uh, without messing up user experience and taking too long for something to, uh, you know, to actually work? So here's the hardware side. Um, you know, there's there's lots of talks uh, on hardware security and exploitation and things like that. You know, there's uh, you know you need UART, which is your serial, you know, uh, asynchronous serial inputs. Basically, for manufacturing, you need a UART connection to make sure, uh, you know, for example, routers, your WPS pin set correctly, your WPA2 password is random, um, or for uh, you know just verification that. The firmware is actually loaded on the device before you ship it out. Uh, some places, uh, you know, ship with JTAG too. JTAG is like another debugging interface for manufacturers. Uh, I don't know if you guys know JTAG. Everybody's always like talking about, you know, I just JTAGged it. You know, it's like, yeah, but what is JTAG? Like, what, how are you JTAGging? There's not a lot, a lot of info out there, and it's usually kind of undocumented. So you have to uh, use some sort of tool to, or you know, 
can figure it out, basically. But it, you can just pull firmware from the JTAG interface. Uh, you know, view art, you can just, you know, it's almost like a like terminal access. Some people have it authenticated, some people don't. Then you have your SPI, your SOIC, and your I2C on the board, kind of lower level, uh, where you know, you know, you have tools like Shikra, the Zipiter Shikra, that actually uses all three, you know, UR, SPI, and JTAG. You can sniff everything from there. You can pull firmware um, from various vectors. You can use, you know, if a board only has UR, I'm gonna use Shikra, or uh, you can use Bus Pirate too. But uh, there's little reasons why you would want to use Shikra over Bus Pirate for. Uh, timing reasons. Sometimes you get a timing issue with Bus Pirate, it won't work. But uh, that's basically plugging in, soldering in, or you have paths that, that solder in into uh, the UR headers on the board. Uh, you know, you have JTagulator, a lot of you know tools to actually do these uh, hardware exploitations on these devices. Uh, flash ROM. You know, obviously you need your your multimeters to see you know uh, what energy is being output. So if you have zero, if you have one, you know. Usually, if there's if there is is something being outputted, uh, that's uh, a transmit pin, so you know, okay, I'm gonna solder something there. You know, my uh, my UART connection. Uh, you know, and you have your chip quick to take off, take off chips, take off. Um, you know, it's uh, if people try to hide their UART or JTAG interfaces, you can just use chip chip quick take take whatever it is off, heat it up with like a, a blow dryer. Um, you know, it takes it off pretty easy, but to put it back on, you don't want to use something like Chip, uh, chip Quick. You want to probably resolder it on, or if you don't jam your board already. And then you have embedded general, you know, operating system security on the device. Uh, like I said, it could be Linux, it could be Windows, it could be a uh, real-time operating system. Uh, you know, you have your tool chains, your libraries. Um, you know, it could be you know, your HTTP libraries, your UPnP, or Anything really in how you actually configure it, um, and again, you know, have some common attack vectors and less common. Uh, usually, application layers. Usually, okay, I'm gonna go to the web interface and try to uh, get pull something from the firmware uh, rather than the hardware aspect. So you're exploiting via software rather than hardware. Um, so you have your different interfaces there, and again, your kernels. Kernel exploits are getting ridiculous now uh, for Linux. It's 115 as of uh, last year, actually, CVEs, and uh, some of them with exploitable code, some of them not. Uh, but just to think of you know, these devices using uh, Linux and how many uh, uh, vulnerabilities are out there. Because they're usually old kernels, just, just the way it happens. I don't know why. By the time it, uh, it's not like, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a, like a, like a SaaS type of uh, workflow for the developers. You don't have the agile as a true agile. You know, you have to you know do these firmware updates. You have to rely on, on the customer. Otherwise, they get mad because their uh, device rebooted in the middle of the day, or whatever. They need access to it. So it's not something that you can just force on them. Um, you know, you could opt in to uh, auto update, but again, you know, sometimes they get kind of mad. We did that a couple times in Linksys, and it wasn't really a good idea. Uh, it's a bad idea. It's good. It's good security from a security perspective, but UX. That's the whole battle. When you have consumer products, it's not like like I said, it's not like a, like a SaaS, you know, a, a web app uh, where you, you fix one, you fix them all. Um, you know, you're going to have some outliers on there, and you're, you're relying on the consumer to actually be aware of these issues, be aware there's a new firmware update, so it's our job to make sure, like, you know, they log in, hey, new firmware update, please update security issues, like, you need to update now. I would highly recommend it. Um, so, you know, so you have hardware, hardware security, embedded security, you have wireless security. You know, different RF frequencies I was talking about with uh, the protocols. Uh, you know, there's plenty of, of tools, frameworks, and hardware devices to exploit these different protocols. Um, so Zigbee, you have the uh, Killer B framework, you use these AppMail, uh, little USB dongles, uh, upload uh, custom firmware that the Killer B has. Uh, and then from there, you can sniff and inject uh, Zigbee packets. So 802.12.4 is what Zigbee is. And, um, you know, Zipiter is going to release the RF cat, uh, Zigbee, so specifically for Zigbee, uh, retrieve and transmit packets in Zigbee. So, uh, like these, uh, the, all these light bulbs, basically, they're based off of Zigbee because you can you can group them, and uh, again, you can mesh, you create a mesh network by grouping them, and they auto heal themselves. So you can put, you know, okay, my lights in my living room, my lights in uh, my garage, I want those to be one group, I 
a lot of likes in my, in my room to be one group. Um, and they all communicate over, uh, you know, it is SSL encryption in the 28 bit, but you go on Wireshark and the key's there to decrypt it. So honestly, there's no point. Um, and then I think a couple months ago, actually, Link, Link is actually a Zigbee's uh, like to license a Zigbee uh, device. You have to, you know, by Zigbee Alliance, you have to get a, like a certification, basically. You have the Zigbee logo on it, on there. And uh, they give you like this symmetric key to actually sign the device. Everybody has the same one, GE, Balkan, uh, Osram, Sylvania, and that got leaked like two months ago. Like, so that, that was their whole you know, way to keep it secure, and now everybody can create their own, update their own lights if they wanted to using that, that, um, that, that key to create these linked devices. So it's pretty, pretty scary. Uh, you have the, you know, the normal 802.11 wireless, wireless attacks, aircraft, things like that, Wi-Fi. A lot of people rely on their home, on their home um, wireless network security, WPA2, I'm good, I'm safe. No, no, not really. There's so many ways to get past that now. Uh, me being at a, at a, a, a router manufacturing company, I see some crazy things. People, it's like your router's not even there anymore. And you're like, wow, how the heck did that happen? But just by you clicking on something, it opens basically like a door in your network sometimes, straight, straight to your computer, uh, depending on, on what payload or something you clicked on. Very, very simple, especially through your browser. Uh, you know, you have things like NAT, you know, you know, network address translation, basically public internal IPs. It traverses that easily. Uh, you know, with the, say if there's an outv uh, for example, outdated version of a uh, NAT PMP library in the firmware, and uh, you know, you're vulnerable, and there's Metasploit modules out for it, and you as a consumer, you haven't up updated your, you know, your, your device on, uh, you know, your wearable, your, your your power switch, or your router, and uh, anything that, that goes out uh, from your network uh, leaves that, that pinhole, that port, open, so anybody can just straight traverse your network and hit your devices inside your, inside your local network, and you're not, you know, it's like you don't have a firewall, there's nothing there, and all they need to do is uh, have something open from the inside to create that, that, uh, that door uh, to, to be open, and uh, that attack vector to be live. <clears throat> so then you have Z-Wave here, Z Wave is a different type of protocol, as the you know, same kind of licensing model as Zigbee, um, where the, the Z Wave, I don't know if they're Alliance, I don't know what it is, but you have to go through their certification standards. Same thing as Wi Fi, too, wireless uh, Wi Fi Alliance, you have to go through their standards. You know, you have to have WPS, unfortunately. I've been trying to get that thing off. I hate, I hate it. Um, but uh, so Z Wave, they have, they, there's a framework called Z Force um, that's used just to to attack, sniff, and inject uh, Z-Wave packets too. I think there was an article uh, in a couple talks at Black Hat on uh, hacking Z-Wave home automation systems. Uh, it's very interesting. <clears throat> and there's, uh, there's Bluetooth LE, uh, low energy. TI actually has a ton of boards and helps you out with uh, actually creating, sniffing, and injecting uh, devices to secure your network. They have everything from, uh, from Zigbee, wireless, Bluetooth LE, uh, I don't think they have Z-Wave, but uh, I think they have another one, NFC Sniffers. Uh, I, have, I have it in my notes, in my, uh, my speaker notes here. Um, it's actually ti.com forward slash tool forward slash packet sniffer. And it has everything. It tells you the board, what board you need, what chipset you need. Uh, and then it gives you a, uh, like a Windows uh, binary tool to basically install so you can see all the packets and inject and sniff and whatever you want to do. So. It's freely available. All these things are out there. Just people aren't really looking at it yet. There's only like a certain number of people, actually, I don't know, a couple companies, researchers, people doing it on their own time. So that's TI. TI is kind of famous for this C11101 uh, chip, transmits and receives. These are the, uh, the little chips that people are stealing cars with. You get the little uh, grill toys, and uh, you, it has a JTAG interface. Upload your own firmware, and uh, whenever you click you know, your car to open it up, it, it captures that, um, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, payload, but it basically it captures it and uh, you replay it back to the car to open the door. And this is the same guy who actually, uh, it's my buddy Sammy, he created the, the lock, uh, you know, the master lock, breaking it with less than eight tries, and he did the whole key sweeper, you know, breaking uh, uh, the wireless, uh, what is it, for, for the keyboards, or Microsoft keyboards. Uh, the same guy who's doing this type of research. 
Uh, so it's mostly left to researchers who are actually looking at this stuff because it's actually a real, like real world problems affects people's lives, your cars, your house, your you know it could be fires, it could be whatever, just your your, net, your security of your of your, uh, your your files, whatever it is at home. Uh, it's, you know nobody wants their their info to be kind of freely available and, and out there and posted and um, you know it's kind of you know my job to do my due diligence to make sure you guys are secure as consumers and don't have to worry about it for smart home devices, routers, whatever it is. So I thought this is my first time sniffing VLE traffic. It's like thirty dollars to get one of these boards too, the Bluetooth LE. You know, Android app security. Oh my gosh, Android app security is ridiculous. Um, you know, I test these partners because we have ODMs basically create the whole app app architecture, and I'm going through these things like, wow, you know, they have no. Well, obviously they have no training. They're developers. It's cool. Uh, it happens. It's not their job, but you know, they they learn over time after you find all the vulnerabilities and you kind of walk through them and show them, hey, this is why this is an issue. But again, ten man team, four or five developers. Just trying to get something that works. Stack Overflow, like, like everybody else who codes, is their best friend. My best friend too, but you know, for them, it really is. Uh, you know, and you have you know your whole usually like hybrid apps. So hybrid is almost like a like an Android app with the web view. It's almost like a web app, basically. But you know, uh, like the browser through your phone and through your app, you get access through uh, the local uh, classes and things inside your phone for Android. So you have security issues, you have security privacy issues, client side issues. You know you have forms and parameters that you know have to be validated. Um, um, they're taking trust in frameworks uh, for for Android or anything else. Um, you know web apps too. Uh, all the permissions. You know they're using things like PhoneGap, Cordova. Uh, you know to make it easy to build these uh, these hybrid apps. And these things require a ton of permissions, and they're not even looking. Hey, do I need? You know, uh, this Bluetooth, and I'm not even using it. Do I need GPS? Uh, they're kind of just, hey, it works, it works, and that's it. So with, with Android, you kind of have um, about five, uh, five key things uh, and usages for Android security, and that is, you know, activities, which you see intense, how those activities are actually being um, displayed to you. Uh, you have broadcast receivers. Those are like push messages sometimes. Uh, you have content providers, how you share data within your own app. Uh, and that's also a big issue. People kind of leave it open, leave everything well readable to get access to that app. So usually, like with the Android security model, it's it's contained to only your, your user ID as the app. But when you have an open cont uh, content provider, everybody has access to your app. Anybody can query it. Anybody can do what they want. So it's it's really you know like I said, these device these uh, mo mobile apps, Android apps, are controlling your home, controlling your your garage door opener when you're not home. Uh, your, your your Bluetooth LE lock that's Communicating over, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, whatever it is, uh, you have memory security issues. Uh, same thing with firmware, but you know, you have buffer overflow still. They're still relevant, you know, um, within mobile within mobile apps. Uh, a lot of the IDEs and Android Studio they help you out uh, during the build process to not have to worry about this. But people uncheck it for whatever reason. People uncheck it uh, for like ASLR and things like that to randomize the memory addresses. You know, you have secure storage. You know, you're storing. You have a camera. Uh, you know, things, you know, looking at your room, your kitchen, uh, your living room, things like that, and the, the videos are being saved to uh, your SD card, and your SD card is well readable by any app. Anything, anybody can pull it, anybody can send it out, copy it, do whatever it is, whatever they want to do. Uh, and it's mostly for usability. For example, people have, uh, you know, their galleries in Android. They want to be able to see in the galleries, not within a separate app in their own container. So, you know, there's some little, you know, security issues like that. Uh, not little, actually. It's actually a pretty big deal to me and probably is to you guys. But, you know, you want these devices to communicate over something that's secure. You know, SSL, TLS. Well, I'd rather use TLS 1.2, but something called SSL pinning. Basically forcing uh, SSL uh, tra uh, transport communication uh, from the client device, from the app. So the app is making sure on the client that uh, SSL... Uh, is, is happening right over, you're pinning to the fingerprint of the RSA cert, basically, uh, your domain, only, you know, um, balkan.com is allowed, uh, you know, not self-signed certificates, so you can't proxy that data, that's the reason why. You don't want somebody to be able to go into your network and uh, see the calls between, you know, me turning off my lights, me opening my door, my garage door. Uh, you want all that traffic to be uh, encrypted 
That way nobody, nobody, so nobody will be able to uh, proxy that data with uh, like BERT, for example, or, or ZAP. Usually they're over HTTP interfaces or something like that, something similar. So again, Android, Android app security is, is, is huge. Again, these, these, these apps control your devices, so you want to make sure they're coded in the most secure way. Um, you know, without, you know, I don't know if secure coding will ever be uh, realistic, but uh, you know, just with these ODNs and people, even regular teams, uh, aren't really you know, fully up to date with Android app security. And depending on what API level you're targeting for Android, there's different features um, that you can take advantage of that people don't know. So there's access control features, like with, with content providers, for example, uh, in like Android API 21 or 22, something like that. So you need to keep it open, use a, use a lower level uh, API, or you can use something higher and outdate older phones. Everybody's using KitKat now, 4.4, Android 4.4. But uh, you know, PMs and you know, people like, they don't really know, you know what people are using, they're just worrying about the, the app working. User experience is, is their main concern. Uh, feel free to ask any questions anytime. I don't want to have to, you know. Yeah. Is there any different on iOS? Yeah, it's next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so again, uh, they have, uh, iOS has UI web, web view. Same thing, you know, it's like a web browser within the app. Uh, same type of issues, you know, you have cross site scripting, SQL injection using a form. Same web app vulnerabilities, same, same, same thing. You're using the same uh, jQuery library, same kind of JavaScript. It's the same thing, but now you have your phone, which you use all your numbers, all your text messages, everything in that device, and things to control your home. You know, you're, it's just another big, huge attack vector. Uh, you know, iPhone has, uh, iOS has different uh, protection standards. They have uh, data protection, so kind of stored securely in a way. You can store it in your keychain. You can store it securely after. You know, everybody does it after you put the passcode on your phone. So it's like until authentication. But that's usually just. You know, uh, once you put your passcode, everybody does. It's, it's unencrypted or it's it's in plain text, basically. But um, you know, uh, so iOS SDK again, memory memory stack buffer overflows. They have iOS uh, by default again uh, has stack canaries and to to prevent from buffer overflows within your app. Um, even when uh, you compile the app and build it, it'll tell you if there's memory issues, if there's buffer issues, and things like that within Xcode. Uh, so that's pretty awesome on their part. Um, iOS also does a lot, um, or Apple has a lot of documentation on iOS security and how to uh, enable or disable, well, you don't want to disable, but enable uh, a lot of these features. Again, injection attacks, same thing. Um, you know, we have uh, black box assessments, so basically it's different to test the iPhone than it is Android. Um, I could get into a whole mobile security discussion, but. Um, Basically, you have to jailbreak an iPhone uh, to actually do auditing on the app, unless you have the code there. But again, you want to have a jailbroken device. You can't use like an emulator in Android, and uh, even when you do use an emulator in Android, uh, like if you just SSL pinning, you want to use your own rooted device to actually overwrite the trust store of Android to use your own certificate, for example. So, so there's differences when you want to use a physical device uh, versus uh, an emulator. Xcode has a simulator for iOS, but that's based off of uh, x86 architecture, so phones are, are ARM-based ARM um, instruction sets. So, uh, you know, so you have a lot of freely available tools, something called IDB. It'll you know, tell you if the app is using data protection, for example. Um, you, you'll, you can stream syslog live, uh, so if the app's logging anything, and you can't see it because you're not you know, within uh, the app's kind of user permission. You can uh, use something at IDB to stream all logs and see, you know, if it puts, oh, here, here's a, the token that, that I communicate to uh, AWS for all, everybody's home, you know what I mean? So there's people who do that, they hard code uh, credentials within their app or they'll, they'll log it, whatever their private keys, whatever it is. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, like HomeKit. Secu uh, Apple's trying to make it more secure in their own way with HomeKit. Uh, the cool thing, though, is that uh, they have something called a secure element, so you, you can store things securely within iOS devices, like a TPM. It's a hardware security level that you know only that app has access to to store those secrets. Android doesn't have that uh, unless you're using Samsung, like Knox, for example. But not a, a company that works on consumer or IoT devices is not going to uh, specify only Samsung Knox devices. Uh, it makes it hard hard for their code base to update 
to only, spend, only uh, target iOS devices, for example. Uh, but HomeKit's cool only because, again, secure element. Everything else, you know, you can go through your settings and stuff, and you can control your home via HomeKit. The HomeKit, uh, I don't know if it's an app, I guess. Rather than like Wink Hub or your own, you know, Falcon app or whatever it is, uh, you can control just uh, HomeKit if you have more than, uh, you know, different types of technologies there. You know, web app operational. You know, who's, who's looking at, at ACLs from AWS? Who's looking at whitelisted IPs? Who's looking at, uh, you know, getting DDoS, for example? Who's looking at logs? Uh, who's looking at the, uh, you know, the communication between the web server, the app server, database server? Are they in, you know, VPC or are they publicly available? Again, have change control when things are being changed. Code's being pushed. Uh, you know, third-party libraries. It's, it's, it's a ton. You can imagine, this is a developer. He's like, what? They don't even know what's going on. <laughs> it's a ton of things to worry about. Not even as security professionals. You can't. You can't be experts in every you know aspect: hardware, software, mobile, web. It's, you know, you could be pretty good. But you're not going to be a master at one. And then you have RF again. RF's a whole other learning curve. Uh, sorry, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> so we're going to uh, known security downfalls. We'll, we'll start there. <laughs> I got these from uh, Security Reactions. They have like one of the DevOps reactions and stuff. They're great. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, Jonathan Broussard, basically uh, the process of, of, of devices and hardware and computers uh, being, when they're, when they're being manufactured, there's so many hand, handoffs to different companies and different people and different companies. Basically how, some, how you summarize it, it's a, secu it's a security concern. Back doors, manufacturing time, you always hear that, you know. It's usually at the ODM level. ODMs are the guys who will have, hey, you send this user, user agent, now you have root access to the server. All right, I mean, this, uh, this router, this embedded device, because they're using it for debugging purposes, and they just forget to, forget to take it off. And a lot of, it, a lot of their excuses are debugging. Like, I, want, I, I put that there so I can make sure things are working. But it's like, dude, come on. Like, it's a big hole. Like, if you can do it, I can do it, too. Like, you just, and again, it's just uh, another layer. Like, you have binary reversing. You can look through you know, static passwords and things like that. So things, you know, what not to do. Uh, with, with your IoT devices and how to keep them secure. So, you know, you don't, you don't want to expose your UR pins, uh, but if you do, you want to authenticate it with a long password. Because uh, even if they do, you know, try to crack that password, that 32 character password that's, you know, su uh, you know ra randomly generated, they're going to have a hard time. Because you, you'll find talks like at DEF CON, if you guys look for, you know, IoT stuff. Yeah, last year, uh, they do have, they do find people who, who authenticate the UR uh, interface, but it's like, the same, you know, it'll be like Falcon, just to get in. You're like, okay, well, that wasn't hard. Or, the, or they'll just do a, you know, a crack it, and they'll crack it within like 30 minutes because it's something simple. It's usually something simple because everybody has to know it for debugging reasons. I don't know why, but debugging reasons. Uh, and again, here, uh, debugging scripts uh, and backdoor user agents. I talked about that. I put a little present there because that's what they're leaving you. A little present for later. I'm going to come back and people on you guys. So, you know, private keys, private keys on devices, whether it's firmware, whether it's private keys on mobile devices, uh, anything held on the client side, not a good idea, unless you guys have a secure element. Uh, whatever it is, some sort of hardware encryption layer. Um, the reason why we're not using it, in case you guys are wondering, like, oh, why don't you get to it in the, you know, at, at the firmware level, the hardware level, it's because price. When you get to consumer manufacturing, uh, everything is down to cents. Like, if, oh, you know, uh, secure elements, 10 cents, you know, times, you know, 100,000. They're like, oh, no, we can't do that. It's 10 cents. When it comes down to four, yeah, we'll think about it. And it's like, because these, these like, uh, these wireless chips are like $3. I mean, no, I'm sorry, like three cents. Like these Broadcom ones, they're very, the margins are super, super, super thin. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's why they're not in use yet. So we're just waiting for it to get kind of cheaper um, so we can justify it. Or oh, maybe we'll talk about that in the next couple slides, but. Uh, you know, okay, again, what not to do default passwords, static static passwords, and it, it could be in, in your firmware, you're thinking no one's going to look through my firmware, my firmware is safe. No, it's not. You know, there's people you know, like me and a lot of other guys who will rip it apart, extract it, and mount it up and take a look, just to look. Why not? Or you just look at the binary, cut out the strings, and grep where you want passwords or something that looks kind of funky. Um, and then the other kind of big scary part is the hardware level HDL backdoors that can be um, you know, put by the manufacturer, uh, 
or ODM, but whoever is actually assembling these uh, devices. Uh, and again, they could say it's for debugging and just, you know, push to the side, but it's, it's a pretty big deal. And you hear a lot of um, nation state concerns really uh, around that idea. You go into conspiracies and things, but we don't want to do that. So embedded, how, how, do you, how do you actually secure these, these embedded devices? You know, restrict shell, uh, you know, use some tamper resistance, you know, epoxy, subscreen, again, it's just, you're not gonna, it's just gonna make it longer for, you know, the researcher, the attacker, the people, they're, these, these are targeted attacks. They're not, you know, you haven't seen a worldwide, you know, compromise on all these devices, IoT devices or whatever, but so they're targeted on individual, typically, on, on your home or whatever, kidnapping, there's, there's a ton of different use cases. Uh, again, very long passwords if you're gonna have any authentication interfaces. Uh, update your kernel, update your packages, um, you know, whatever you use for your media, your, your file sharing, um, your web server, your embedded web server, anything like that, you know, make sure everything's updated. Uh, you know, usually these, you know, we use like OpenWRT, for example, we use BusyBox, you know, you're probably familiar with BusyBox and Android, you know, if you're rooting your device, but you, know, you want to pull out what you don't need for these embedded devices, not only for space, but for security reasons, because if you're leaving, you know, Perl, for example, there, uh, you have another whole attack vector that somebody can just target using Perl without you even knowing. Uh, we want to do secure updates, GPG signing over an encrypted channel, making sure that that firmware image is actually the image that we uploaded as a manufacturer. Um, not many people are doing that, and you want to SSL pin when you're doing that too, so make sure nobody can man in the middle and um, you know, upload their own firmware to the device. That's another big issue that you kind of see all the time. Uh, secure C functions. We'll get into that right now. Uh, you want to verify and test code. Uh, same thing, QA. Uh, you, want, you want to pen test this, these things too. You want to, you know, static analyze it. You also want to dynamically test it when it's making these calls. You know, at the end of your secure development lifecycle, hopefully. Um, so you should be, you should be in the beginning in the, ne the network discussions. Uh, you should be, you know, when the you get the first iteration of the hardware and the software, and in the end, right before it goes to production. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do at, at Belkin. So secure, secure C functions. There's Terrell copy. You guys can take a look at that. That looks pretty funny. But basically, this is a real issue. It's I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna go away. Um, and old, what, old, what's old is new. Um, C code, you know, STR copy, string cat, still being used like crazy. You might think the device is crashing, but hey, no. You know, it's actually buffer overflowing. You just have an exploit if you have. Regulatory impact, I'm pretty short on time, but FTC, you know, basically saying implement secure by design. How are you gonna do that with all these different hands, like all these people touching this code, all these different technologies? It's ridiculous, but, you know, and they don't, they don't even address the, the supply chain aspect, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of a, a, a tall list of, to expect from a manufacturer or a startup company creating these IoT devices to actually, you know, make sure it's secure and there's so many layers. Privacy by design, security by design, both FTC and EU Commission. Um, right now, that's the only thing that has that has our backing as, as a security professional for a consumer company is, hey, FTC is going to get on us, we're going to get fined. Other than that, we have nothing. You know, it's basically my instinct, hey, this is insecure, we shouldn't do this. Everything else is like usability. You know, if, if it works, it works, and if we don't think it's safe, as a PM, the PM will make a decision, um, then you know, it's based on their discretion. And you know, they're not addressing uh, IoT supply chain, but you know, how can we make it more secure? I'll say by liability, uh, meaning put it in you know, your agreements with uh, the manufacturer, put it in ODMs, making sure that they do test their code. That, you know, if they don't, you know, whatever, uh, we're gonna you know, take away $5,000, I don't know what it is, but you can do whatever, just any type of repercussions, hold, holding them liable to you know, the security bugs or, or actually making them you know, go to training. Hey, you, know, you guys have to, your team, did your team go to training, you know, security training, have you guys ever, whatever, some sort of questionnaire, and then have that in your contract um, so they're aware and make sure, you know, that you're serious, that, you know, this is a real issue, and I, I, don't, I don't think anybody's doing that, but this is something that we're, we're actually starting to do with, you know, our, our, our driver vendors, our ODM vendors, and things like that, um, just to add a level of, of security. Um, and, you know, you know, legal repercussions again, community projects. I'm actually leading the embedded security uh, AppSec project for OWASP, so we're gonna have a call next week if anybody's interested. Uh, I have a list of about 20, I'm gonna get it down to 10, make it more digestible for teams to actually use practically. 
Uh, so we have the whole IoT top 10, but these guys from HP, good guys, but they don't know how these devices are being made. You know, I see how it is to, you know, from day one to, to uh, deployment, mass production. Uh, you know, security into SDLC, like I was saying in the beginning, the middle and the end uh, type of situation. And then, uh, you know, maybe we can make some sort of uh, certification, you know, how Zigbee and Wi-Fi does. Make it some sort of, you know, security or uh, alliance, whatever it is. That's, that's one idea. Uh, but who, who knows? Yeah. Firmware is typically readily available. We can download them. Uh, you could, yeah. Uh, I'm, I, hope, I suggest... What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. He's, he asked if we have any um, open source firmware and uh, can we basically encourage, right? Encourage people well, to like, work, with work with the community. Encourage. Yeah, so he's asking if, you know, for open source firmware, uh, do we, um, I guess, can you pull, pull and merge uh, your code over, over to open source software that we use? And we do. We have everything G, uh, GPL. Uh, we push. Yeah, 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 no, no, for sure. Any, yeah, yeah, yeah. We incorporate fixes. We have to. We use these things. Um, it gets a little, little hairy there, but yeah, we do. And I, I encourage people to actually look at these drivers, these uh, firmware images. That'll help me, and that'll help everybody else. Because there's not a lot. Of, you know, you don't see you know Netgear guys or other security IoT vendors out there who are actually looking at this type of uh, security uh, attack surfaces and things like that. So again, it's just defense in depth. You're never going to be 100% secure. Again, you have different, you know, you might be secure at the web app level, it might be secure at the mobile level, but there's still hardware, they're still embedded, you know, you still have low level secure coding uh, issues. So it's all about, you know, just creating, you know, uh, defense strategies and what you can do uh, to make it kind of harder, slower for the attacker and make it uh, safer for you as a consumer uh, who has an IoT device. So there's things like build it securely, OWASP, like I was saying, top 10, embedded, uh, bug crowd. Um, we just finished the bug crowd bug bounty for Belkin. It was okay, but again, not, not a lot of people. It's kind of like a, a niche kind of uh, skill to look at these devices. We, we sent our link uh, LED bulbs. We, you know, we didn't get much with it, but you know, you know, we're open to anybody. You don't have to be. You don't have to be a bug bounty, but you know, you guys can always help us out. You know, we'll send you devices, whatever it is. If you guys are gonna look at it, we'll take it. And then Bill Securely is uh, you know a group of, of researchers. Uh, who are actually doing this. Uh, there's not too many of them, but uh, they're trying their best to use expertise within you know, what they know to look over these devices. Uh, they, it could be like medical devices they're looking at and just regular IoT devices. Yeah, thank you guys. Any questions? Yes. Is your slideshow available? Yes, I think it'll be on YouTube as well, from what I understand. But yeah, if anything, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it out. I'll share it with you guys. Yes. You know, I'm sure they do, but IoT devices are not targeting those. Maybe government, you know, government devices that aren't, you know, consumer available. You know, so my perspective is more consumer, not enterprise or like government yet, because I think